Hello folks, I want to talk a little bit about the guidelines that are coming out from the Canadian government about the usage of generative AI by its employees. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the guide itself uh, for the use of generative AI, a little bit about what the Cybersecurity Center is saying, some stuff about how the government is relying on their values documents to inform the work that they're doing, and also this is not a conversation about BLC 27. Uh, if you're interested in that conversation, uh, check out Bianca Wiley. She's got a great article giving context for that piece. This is about the internal guidance that's being given and sort of what that has to say about maybe what we need to be teaching students who are going out into the workforce and going out into society. Uh, I think there's some, some hints in there about where we might want to go as an education system. So first and foremost, this is a cybersecurity warning. Please be aware. Generative AI is not giving answers. It doesn't give you a response. It's a system that does very, very good guessing. It can be wrong, illogical, unaware, biased in all those ways. I just want to put that warning out front uh, for anybody who is coming to this for the first time. There's a lot of research out there on this, uh, so do beware if you're going to use this at all. Uh, in a nutshell, the guidance that's being given by the Canadian government is that uh, the generative artificial intelligence can offer potential benefits for the institution, but that its usage should be restricted to places where risks can be effectively managed. And so there's a lot in here that I think we need to understand. So potential benefits, it can help. But in order to understand where risks can be effectively managed, you really kind of need to know the topic that you're talking about, right? So one of the things that really comes out in sort of the guidelines is that you need to kind of be an expert to be able to use it to improve your work because you need to be able to see where the bias is. You need to be able to understand the things that come out wrong. Right, so it can help you with sort of repetitive tasks in a sense where I think there's less concern, but when we get into things like nuance and complexity, we gotta be much, much more careful. Um, when we look at the tasks that are suggested by the Canadian government, writing and editing documents, emails, coding tasks, some of the stuff that's being done with generative AI right now with coding is amazing. Um, brainstorming, which makes me a little worried. So if you're doing brainstorming using one of these systems, um, then basically what it's doing is choosing the most popular answers. So your brainstorming ends up being the popular answers or the ones that show up on the internet the most, which should lead to a certain degree of caution in terms of that. I certainly wouldn't leave systems like this to do all my brainstorming. And then there's that word research in there, uh, which also concerns me a little bit because we have long established processes for research for really good reasons. So I'd also uh, apply some caution to that too. I'd want someone to be already an expert in a, in a field before they were using this to help their research. The reason for that is that a lot of our traditional processes have our values baked in. So when we look at something like a book that's been written, um, before you release a book, before you release a document that's printed on paper, you know you're never going to get a chance to come back to that document again. There's a whole process of editing and caution and review that happens because you know once that artifact is created, it's gone, it's out of your hands, right? So that, that value of caution and paying attention is something that happens on the front end, right? And it's baked into a lot of the things that we do. That paper publishing model while certainly not as efficient as the digital stuff that we do, does mean that there are a lot of checks and balances that happen. It goes through editors, somebody has to print it. There's a whole process that happens that in a lot of these digital usages don't happen. And when you get something like generative AI, which produces an artifact, you could just send it as soon as it's produced. We don't have a whole lot of practices for review inside of digital spaces. And so when we're looking at how our values can be thread, we need to understand how our existing processes work, why they work the way that they do before we enter into a conversation about how we can use AI to support those things. So it's about reviewing the processes we currently have, understanding where our values sit inside of there, and then doing the work accordingly. And I think the, the folks uh, who produced this document have done a really nice job of this. So if you look at uh, this is section six of Value Alive, a uh, thing that's been created by the Canadian government, and this is their guide to ethical decision making. So if you look at this guide, and then you see the risks that they talk about later, you see they match up really, really closely. And there's a couple here that um, I think jump out nicely. The first one is gather the facts. So before you start using any of these systems, I think one of the things you need to do is actually be informed about the issue that you're doing so that you're able to do some of the checks and balances. 
I like the consider your character and integrity piece, like consider where the human is involved in this process. And you'll see as we go through how these um, values for ethical decision making show up in the kind of risks that they're talking about. So when the government talks about the risks, um, that public servant autonomy lines up against that um, personal piece we talked about earlier, right? So as an employee of the Canadian government, there's some expectation that you're going to take responsibility for believing and being able to stand behind the content that you've given out. That requires you to do an awful lot of work after a piece of generative AI has created a document for you, right? That you have the expertise, or at least in your community, you have the expertise to be able to find the bias that comes out of the system, because there's lots of bias built into a lot of these generative AI systems, and then also being able to evaluate the quality of it. Those other issues are important ones as well. So in terms of the legal risks, so if you're creating something and there are all kinds of uh, ways in which they can break laws, and if you don't know enough about the area that you're producing in, you're not gonna be able to evaluate that. The, the idea of distinguishing humans from machines is one that I haven't seen um, come out very much at this point. So I think a lot of people are trying to disguise their writing um, if it has been started with AI, there are some people who are declaring it in like academic journal articles where they're saying that, uh, for instance, ChatGPT is a co-author. So there they're distinguishing the humans and the machines, but not necessarily the text, what was written by a human and what was written by a machine. Um, but again, this comes out of the values that the Canadian government has stated. And it's going to be difficult for people to figure out what work they want to be able to preserve, what work they want to be able to support if they've not done this value work on the front end. And I think the environmental impact is one that we need to keep talking about in terms of this issue, which is these tools actually burn up a lot of energy. And it's important to understand the overall impact as we transition to using some of these tools culturally. Um, there are a lot of general guidance sections inside of this. So each one of those categories that I just stated have a whole series of guidances are associated with them. And I encourage you, if this is an issue that's important to you, to really go through the document. There's a lot of useful guidance in there, I think. Um, what I want to point out here, uh, one, you'll see that the fourth uh, bullet point here talks about improving your ability to identify bias and discriminatory content. Essential that we do that work so that we're going to be able to do the review. In that first piece, it says review generated content to assure it aligns with commitments, values, ethics, and meets obligations. That review part is really something that's going to be coming at the end of the creation of a document, of an artifact. Traditionally, we work towards the creation of a document, and then we send it in. Right? What's happening now is the creation part, actually, when you're using these tools, happens really quickly. And then all the work happens after. When you're doing lots of research and you're, you're organizing ideas and you're organizing paragraphs, there's all kinds of checks and balances that happen there while you're doing that work. And I think what's really essential looking at these tools and what really comes out of these recommendations for me when I start thinking about this as an educator is how I need to encourage my students and actually in my own work too, to set aside the time for review, right? So if you think that uh, using one of these tools is going to take an hour to create a document, you need to add, I don't know what it's going to be, but let's say three hours to the end of that to do a review for bias, to do a review for the content, to do some cross-referencing, to do some analysis of that document to make sure that it actually reflects your own values before it goes out the door. And I think that's the real transition we need to, to think about, is how do we build in this sort of review perspective into the way that we teach so that those checks and balances and that ownership of the document is something that we apply to the document and apply to the artifact after it's been created. So to summarize, I think I have three general recommendations. The first one is about knowing your values. Um, and to go back, look at the work that we do as experts and look at our, the work that we that students are doing in, in their own work and have us and them ask themselves, what is the thing that I am trying to represent here? What are the things that I value in this process? The second one is about humility. So up until, um, really until generative AI, you couldn't produce a document when you really didn't know anything about the subject. 
Um, or if you're trying to produce a document about something you didn't know very much about, it was going to be obvious really quickly. I think right now, with all the tools that we have and all the uh, availability of information that we can find on the internet, that humility that I don't know or I don't know enough to do this or I should ask somebody about this has to be almost a literacy that we train, um, has to come to the forefront all the time. We have to be able to say culturally, I don't know. We've been trained not to do this. We've been trained to think that giving an answer is better than not. And I think that's an essential transition that we need to make in this process. And the last one is about networks of trust. So if I'm going to analyze my values and I'm going to have that humility where I look at something and I go, I really don't understand this, then I have to have networks around me that I can reach out to and people I can work with who I can say, look, I don't know enough about this. Can you help me with this? And I think building those networks of trust is an essential step moving forward into a world where we have all this generative AI around us and we're still trying to I hope, maintain the human voice inside of the work that we do. Thank you.